بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان للنبي والذين آمنوا أن يستغفروا للمشركين أن يستغفروا للمشركين ولو كانوا أولي قربا من بعد ما تبين لهم أنهم أصحاب الجحيم The seventh of the month of Ramadan marks the anniversary of the departure of Abu Talib from this life. Abu Talib is the father of Imam Ali alayhi salam and he is the one who took in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and raised Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi after Rasulullah's father and grandfather passed away. As we know, Prophet Muhammad was born an orphan. His father he did not get to see his father, Abdullah. And he went into the custody of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. However, his grandfather raised Rasulullah and took care of him for the first eight years of the life of Rasulullah. After that, Abdul Muttalib also passed away. So now, this young man, Rasulullah, this young man, Muhammad, he is born, he doesn't have a father. And at the age of six, he loses his mother. At the age of eight, he loses his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. So now who takes him in? Who raises him? Who secures his future and protects him? It is his uncle, Abu Talib. Abu Talib, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for Abu Talib to be not only the father of Imam Ali alayhi salam, but also to be the one who raises Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for Abu Talib to raise a prophet, a nabi in his home, and also raise a wasi in his home, a successor of a prophet. Both Rasulullah and Imam Ali were raised in the home of Abu Talib and under the care and the supervision and the love of this great man, Abu Talib, Sayyid al -Badha, the Sayyid, the leader, the master of Mecca. He was a very respected person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in Surah al duha Allah tells him, Alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa wa wajadaka dalan fahada. O Muhammad, you had nothing. You were a yatim, you were an orphan. But it was Allah, it was God who sent those to take care of you. Who sent individuals to raise you and to take care of you. And this is why Allah, the, the following verse immediately after it says, فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ When you see an orphan, don't hurt the feelings of the orphan. When you see someone asking you for help, give that person. Don't reject that person. And speak about the favors of your Lord upon you. Every single one of us, God has blessed us. God has had, has had favors upon us. We forget them. The way that we show our thanks to God is by helping orphans and helping those who are in need and answering the call of anyone who calls upon us. Sometimes God sends people in our lives that do the work of God 
by helping us, by raising us, by providing for us. This is the work of God. They're doing the work of God, but it's being manifested through the actions of certain individuals. One of those individuals was Abu Talib, the father of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the uncle, the paternal uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and the one who raised Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now, this is something that all Muslims agree about. All Muslims accept this. However, the subject of Abu Talib and the fate of Abu Talib is an area of dispute amongst Muslims. There are some narrations which we do not accept. There are some narrations which are fabricated and we do not accept. It says that supposedly Rasulullah says, Abu Talib is going to be in the hellfire. Why? Because Abu Talib did not announce his faith. Abu Talib did not come out publicly and announce his faith. And some people, they come and they say, Abu Talib died as a pagan, just like the people of Mecca. He died as an idol worshiper, just like the people of Mecca. And therefore, he is going to be burned in the hellfire. Abu Talib fi dhahdahin min nar. This is something that many say, Abu Talib, the man who raised the Prophet, the man who showed so much love to the Prophet. Some people, they come and they have the audacity to say that Abu Talib is going to go to hellfire. Abu Talib has a bad fate. Abu Talib has a bad destiny. Now, what's ironic is that the Shias, the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, are always accused of disrespecting the Sahaba and cursing the Sahaba and showing disrespect to the companions of the Prophet. Who is a companion of the Prophet? A companion of the Prophet, they say, من 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 Anyone who saw or heard the Prophet is a companion and of course believed in the Prophet. Now, we are accused of showing disrespect to the Sahaba well, Abu Talib is accused of being a kafir. There's being, takfir is being done. A man who was a believer, a man who believed in the Prophet, a man who supported the Prophet, they come and they say, oh, he's not, he didn't believe, he didn't accept the Prophet, and therefore he's going to go to hell. This is not accepted. But do you know why there's so much negative attention surrounding Abu Talib? And you always hear individuals, they go up on the pulpit and they say Abu Talib this and Abu Talib is going to be in hell. Because Abu Talib committed one crime in their eyes. One crime. That crime was that he was the father of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He gave, he, he, his son was Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this is regarded as a huge crime in the eyes of many people. There is so much hatred towards Ali ibn Abi Talib that they're willing to come and say your father is going to go to hell. Your father died as a non-believer even though his father was one of the most important supporters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This hatred for Ali ibn Abi Talib is a disease in the hearts of many. And they cannot control it. You know on the day of Ashura when they butchered the grandson of the Prophet. Imam al Hussein is the grandson of the Prophet. They butchered him and they killed him. You know what, were they, what they were saying when they were killing Imam al Hussein? They were saying, نَقْتُلُكَ بُغْضًا مِنَّا abik. We are fighting you, not because we have a problem with you. We are fighting you because we have a problem with your father Ali. This is the hatred towards Ali ibn Abi Talib that led so much division within the Muslims and so much fighting and so much hate within the Muslims where the uncle of the Prophet, the man who showed so much love and compassion to the Prophet, until today you find some people, they say he died as an infidel, he died as an as a idol worshiper, as a mushrik, and, and someone who's going to go to the hellfire. Now, where does this all come from? There, everything has a root. Everything has to has, have started at one point. We said why the intentions were there, because of the hatred for Imam Ali alayhi salam. But you go and you look at some of the literature, some of the books. Today, one of the most important books that is accepted in the Sunni school of thought and considered to be the most authentic book is Al-Bukhari. 
a scholar by the name of Bukhari and another scholar by the name of Muslim. They have compiled narrations of the prophets. But the problem is that many of these narrations, so-called the prophet said such a thing, many of these are fabricated. Many of these are not true. Many of these are not authentic. And this is why we Muslims, we believe that the only authentic book is the Qur'an. The only authentic book that can give us our faith and has not been fabricated, has not been played with throughout history is the Qur'an. And this is why we consider the Qur'an to be a miracle because it has not been touched, it has not been altered. Ever since the Prophet recited the verses of the Qur'an, Muslims recorded them and until today those same words are being recited by the Muslims today. However, when it comes to narrations, when it comes to hadith literature, the Prophet said this and the Prophet said that, there has been a lot of fabrication. There have been a lot of manipulation in the books of hadith and even Rasulullah, he himself says, سَتَكْثُرَ عَلَيَّ الْكَذَّابَةِ There are going to be many people that are going to attribute certain things to me that I did not say these things. Certain things they're going to say the Prophet Muhammad said this when the Prophet did not say it. So this is one of those fabricated ahadith narrated by Bukhari and Muslim, which is considered one of the most important books in the lives of the majority of the Muslims, excluding the Shia Muslims. And that is, they narrate that when Abu Talib was passing away, when he was dying, Rasulullah came to him, and at the same time Abu Jahl came to him on one side. Abu Jahl is the head of the pagans, the head of the idol worshippers who was fighting the Prophet and on one side his nephew Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So Rasulullah tells him, oh my dear uncle, say the shahada, say the testament of faith. I bear witness that there is no God other than Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of God. This is the shahada. Say that and you will go to paradise. You will be a person who will be saved and go to paradise. They say, this is what the so-called narration says, that Abu Talib stayed quiet and Abu Jahl and some of the pagans around him, they, say, they tell him, Oh Abu Talib, are you going to leave the traditions and the ways of your fathers and your forefathers? You're going to go against the ways of your fathers and your forefathers? The idol worshippers? So they say Abu Talib did not say anything. And he died not believing. And Rasulullah, despite that, despite that, he said, I'm still going to ask God to forgive Abu Talib because he's my uncle, because I love him. And then supposedly this verse came down. مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا أُلِي قُرْبًا The Prophet and the Mu'mineen, they cannot ask God to forgive someone who's an idol worshipper, even if they're related to them. They cannot ask God to forgive someone who's an idol worshipper, even if they are related to them. Now this is an actual verse from the Qur'an, but the problem is that they have used this verse for a different story. A story that it was not the case that it came down in. Why? There are several reasons. The first reason is that Abu Talib died 10 years after the Ba'tha of the Prophet, 10 years after the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. We know that the Prophet lived in Mecca for 13 years and then he migrated to Medina because of the persecution in Mecca. He migrated to Medina and he lived in Medina for another 10 years until he passed away. 23 years he was delivering the message. And every time something would happen in the lives of the Muslims, any time an important event would take place, verses would be revealed regarding that same circumstance, regarding that same time. So this verse, supposedly with this narration, when the Prophet said, I will ask Allah to forgive my uncle, the verse came down, you cannot ask, you, the Prophet and the believers cannot ask God to forgive someone who's an idol worshiper, even if they're related to them. Supposedly, if that came with this story, it should have came, this verse should have been revealed on the 10th year after the Ba'tha, right? This verse was revealed 12, 12 years later, in the 9th year after the Hijrah. 
ninth year after the migration of the Prophet. Meaning that it was, it was revealed 12 years later with regarding to a different event, a different story. But some people, they came and they took this verse and they tried to bring it to say that Abu Tal this verse came down speaking about Abu Talib and saying that the Prophet cannot ask Allah to forgive Abu Talib. It's very important, this is why it's very important to go into the topic of Qur'anic exegesis. One of, the, one of the things that scholars do when they do the tafsir, the exegesis, is that they see what, what verse was revealed and at what time and what are the particular stories that this verse was revealed in. If we take a verse out of context, if we don't understand the precise context that this verse was revealed in, we're not going to know the full story. We're not going, going to get the big picture. And this is one of the biggest problems that's going on with the Muslim world today. Someone takes a verse out of context and they come and they apply it somewhere else. They apply it with a different meaning. Something that goes against the meaning of Islam and against the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So this is one point. Second, my dear brothers and sisters, this verse, the actual cause and revelation and sabab al nuzul occasion of revelation of this verse has nothing to do with Abu Talib. And other Sunni scholars like Tabari and Fakhr al-Razi, they say that some of the new Muslims, they came to the Prophet when the Prophet was in Medina. This is in the ninth year after the Ba'tha of the Prophet. So 12 years after the death of Abu Talib. The Prophet is in Medina and many people are joining the religion of Islam now. Allah says in the Quran, يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ Afwaja, they come in flocks and they join the religion of Islam. Towards the end of the life of the Prophet, he was so successful, people were coming in groups, in tens and hundreds, and all announcing their Islam. So some of those new Muslims, they come to the Prophet and they tell him, Ya Rasulullah, we believe in you and we accept you and we have left the idol worship and we have left the ways of our ancestors, our pagan fathers and ancestors. However, some of our fathers and forefathers, they were pagan, they were idol worshippers, they didn't believe in God. However, they were good people. They used to take care of their neighbors, they used to help people around them. They used to do a lot of good things, but they were idol worshippers. Can we ask Allah to forgive them? Can we ask God to forgive them? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, Yes, and I will also ask God to forgive them. So this verse came down. مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا أُلِي قُرْبَى مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا أُلِي قُرْبَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ the Prophet first said, I will also ask God to forgive them. But the verse comes and says, the Prophet cannot ask God to forgive someone who's an idol worshiper. Someone says, why? Why can't we ask God to forgive someone who's an idol worshiper? It's just logic, think about it. An idol worshiper is not even believing in God. An idol worshiper is not even acknowledging God. What am I going to ask God to forgive this person? They, they don't believe in this system. How can God come and forgive someone who does not acknowledge Him? Yes, I can ask God to guide someone. I can God, ask God to show someone the way. But asking God who does not acknowledge, asking God to forgive people who do not even acknowledge Him, this does not make sense. And therefore the Qur'an says that the Prophet cannot ask God to forgive those idol worshippers, those mushrikeen. Because in Islam, the greatest sin the greatest sin is considered to be shirk, associating a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Associating a partner with God. And in fact, this is not only the message of Islam. This is the message of all monotheistic religions. This is the message of Abraham. This is the message of Moses. This is the message of Jesus. This is the message of all prophets. They came and they invited people to worship the one and only God. So here... This verse was revealed to say that the Prophet cannot ask God to forgive. Yes, he could ask God to guide people. 
but not forgive people who are idol worshippers. Now, also another reason why we can't accept this is that we have a lot of proof and evidence which shows us that the family of Rasulullah, the family of the Prophet, Bani Hashim, the clan that Rasulullah and Imam Ali came from, they were never idol worshippers, even before Islam. Even though Mecca, the city of Mecca was infested with idol worship, and there were many idol worshippers in Mecca, but Mecca, the, the family of the Prophet, Bani Hashim, they were not idol worshippers. They never prayed to idols. They never bowed to idols. This is why today when Muslims, they say the name of Imam Ali alayhi salam, what do they say? They say, Karram Allah wajha. All the others, they say, Radiyallahu an. May Allah be pleased with them. But when they say the name of Imam Ali, they say, Karram Allah wajha. Why? Because Imam Ali alayhi salam, even before Islam, he never bowed, he never prostrated to an idol. He never did sujood to an idol. And this was something that was known with regards to Bani Hashim. And in a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, ما زلنا ننقل من أصلاب طاهرة إلى أرحام مطهرة. Some people, they come and they say, what about the father of the Prophet? He died before the Prophet, he died before the Prophet was born. How can we... What, what's, what happens to him? Was he a Muslim? Was, it was before, the, before Islam. Yes, it was before Islam. But there were individuals in Mecca who were following and believing in the Abrahamic traditions. In the midst of the idol worshippers, there were individuals that were following the traditions of Abraham. And that, those were the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. In another verse, Allah says in the Quran, وَتَقَلُّبُكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ the, hadith, the, the tafsir of this verse is how is Allah speaking to Rasulullah, how he was passed from the loins and the wombs from one to another, and all of the loins and the wombs that he was passed in were those who were worshippers and those who were praying to God. No, no, no one of the forefathers of Rasulullah or the grandfathers of the Prophet were idol worshippers ever. In another hadith, Al Asbagh ibn Nubata, one of the companions of Amir al Mu'mineen, he says, I heard Imam Ali say, Wallah. ما عبد أبي ولا جدي عبد المطلب ولا هاشم ولا عبد مناف صنما قط. He says not my father and not my grandfather and not Hashim. No one of them worshipped an idol. No one, not once in their life. They asked him what they, what were they doing. He says كانوا يصلون إلى البيت على دين إبراهيم ومتمسكين به. They used to pray to the Kaaba and they would follow the traditions of Abraham, not the traditions of the idol worshippers during that time. This is one proof as well. Another reason, my dear brothers and sisters, is that today if we go and we analyze those narrations that Bukhari narrates, those traditions that are narrated by Bukhari, you see that those traditions were narrated by by individuals that had evident hatred towards Imam Ali alayhi salam. They had clear hatred towards Imam Ali alayhi salam. One man by the name of Hariz ibn Uthman. Another by the name of Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais. Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais, the day, Imam, the day Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim wanted to strike Imam Ali while Imam Ali was praying in Masjid al-Kufa, he comes and he tells him, go and strike him before the sun comes out. Strike him on his head before the sun comes out. Another person, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, who was known to have hatred for the Ahlul Bayt. Another person, a man by the name of Samarah ibn Jundab. This man, Samarah, Muawiyah came and he gave him 400,000 dirhams. Muawiyah tells him, I want you to go out in public in Sham, in Damascus. I want you to go out and recite this verse. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبُكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِهِ وَهُوَ أَلَدُّ الْخِصَامِ And there are some people, when you hear them speak, you are going to be gravitated when they talk. 
but God witnesses that they are the worst of the people. They are the ones who cause mischief in the land. وَإِذَا تَوَلَّى سَعَى فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيُفْسِدَ فِيهَا وَيُهْلِكُ الْحَرْثَ وَالنَّسْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْفَسَادِ Muawiyah tells him, I want you to go out in front of people, in front of those new Muslims who don't know what's going on, who don't know the stories of the revelation. And I want you to tell them that this verse came down referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبُكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِهِ وَهُوَ أَلَدُّ الْخِصَامِ He is the worst of the people. He says, I want you to go out and say that this verse is referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is the reason why this verse was revealed. Samara ibn Jundab, he tells him, if I do this, that means I'm going to be misleading people. Muawiyah tells him, yes, I'll give you money. He tells him, I'll give you 100,000 dirhams to go out. He says, no, that's too little. I'll give you 200,000 dirhams. He says, no, that's too little. He says, I'll give you 400,000 dirhams to go out and say that this verse is referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib. That this verse is referring to Imam Ali, the first Muslim, the first supporter of the Prophet, the first believer in the Prophet. He goes out in front of people, he takes the 400,000 dirham, this man Samara, and he says that this verse is referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know the environment in Damascus at that time was fueled with the propaganda against Imam Ali and the Ahl al-Bayt, where when people heard that Imam Ali died in Kufa, in Iraq, he died while he was praying, he was killed while he was praying. Some people, they came and they said, Ali prays? They were surprised that Ali prays because of all of the false propaganda and misconceptions against Imam Ali salam. They were shocked. This man, Ali prays, the man who we were hearing all these bad things about, he actually prays? They don't realize that he was the first person who prayed with the Prophet. He was the first believer in the Prophet. He was the first supporter of the Prophet. Now what's ironic is that Bukhari narrates from these individuals. Samara, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, al-Ash'ath ibn Qais. But then you come and you ask Bukhari, O oh Bukhari, is there one hadith from Imam al-Sadiq in your book? You, might, you won't find one hadith from Imam Sadiq one tradition from Imam Sadiq, the actual family of the Prophet, the actual relatives and grandchildren of the Prophet, he doesn't narrate one hadith from Imam Sadiq. They tell him, why not? He says, Inna fi qalbi shay. there's something in my heart against Imam Sadiq. This is the grandson of the Prophet. This is the man who was the teacher of all the Muslims. He doesn't narrate from him, but he narrates from those individuals. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, also, if anyone knows who Rasulullah is, if anyone knows the mercy of the Prophet and the love of the Prophet, they will know that the Prophet would not say such a thing about his uncle Abu Talib. Saying that my uncle is in the hellfire, my uncle is suffering and my uncle is going to be tortured. The Prophet is not like that. Let me give you another example. One day after the battle of Badr, the Muslims, they captured Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet. Another uncle of the Prophet, who was not, did not really care and show as much love to the Prophet as much as Abu Talib. So the Muslims, they captured Abdu, Ab, Abbas and they placed him with the prisoners who were fighting them. They placed them all in a tent and they had their hands and their legs tied. Because they were prisoners of war. The Prophet, he's sleeping in the next tent, right next to the tent of Abbas. And he hears Abbas crying and he's not, feel, not very comfortable. He can't sleep because the chains and the ropes are tied to his hands and his legs. Rasulullah cannot sleep that night because his uncle is not comfortable. He comes to the Muslims. He tells them, do you allow me to open the ties of my uncle Abbas? Even though Abbas was fighting him, but he comes and he says, my mercy does not allow me to see my uncle Abbas in this state. And eventually they forgave them all. They forgave all those individuals. So this is how the Prophet was. He was a man of mercy. He was a man of love. Is he going to reciprocate the love that was given to him from Abu Talib by saying he's going to be in the hellfire? This is something that cannot be accepted. And of course, another reason 
you see that these narrations and these traditions that say Abu Talib died a kafir, Abu Talib did not believe, all of these started after the death of the Prophet, after the death of Imam Ali, and this was some of the propaganda that was waged by Bani Umayyah. The Umayyads, they came to power, they came to power and they started spreading so much propaganda in the name of Islam, in the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And the propaganda was against the family of the Prophet. They killed the very grandson of the Prophet. Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Hussein and Muawiyah fought against Imam Ali. So they spread so much propaganda against the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam and this was one of the propaganda that was spread after. If you go and you look at the traces of this, you see that during the time of the Prophet there was no talk of Abu Talib being a believer or non-believer. It was all accepted by all Muslims that Abu Talib is a mu'min, Abu Talib is the supporter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And finally, you come and you look at the life of Abu Talib. If you want to judge someone, go and look at the person's life. Look at the person's actions, look at the person's words. What does this person say? What does this person do? And then you judge that person. When we come and we look at the words of Abu Talib, we see that Abu Talib has many words and ahadith and poems where he praises Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In one hadith, he says, إِنَّ بْنَ آمِنَةَ النَّبِيَّ مُحَمَّدٍ عِنْدِي يَفُوقُ مَنَازِلَ الْأَحْبَابِ He says the son of Aminah, the Nabi, the Prophet Muhammad, he is dearer to me than the dearest people to me. He is dearer to me than the ones who are so dear to me. He calls him a Nabi, he calls him a Prophet. Someone who calls him a Prophet means that he accepts him. He accepts him as a Prophet. In another part of his poem, he says, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ بِأَنَّ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ خَيْرُ أَدْيَانِ الْبَرِيَّةِ دِينَ And I know that the religion of Muhammad is the best of religions. Is someone who does not believe in Rasulullah as a prophet and does not accept him, would he say such a thing? Would he say something like that? Obviously, he wouldn't. And his actions. You go and you read the life of Abu Talib, you see that throughout his whole life, he sacrificed everything for the sake of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He's walking, he sees Rasulullah is praying, and next to him on his right is Imam Ali alayhi salam praying. He's walking with his son Ja'far. He tells Ja'far, O oh Ja'far, Sil Janah ibn Ammik, go and pray on the other side of your cousin Rasulullah and be a defender, be a staunch defender of your, of your cousin Rasulullah. He orders his son Ja'far to go and pray with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He tells him, go and be a supporter. There were times where the Prophet, there, there were chances that the house of the Prophet is going to be attacked. The, there were many who wanted to assassinate Rasulullah. So Abu Talib, every day he would go and he would tell the Prophet, you come and you sleep here in my son's place. You come and you sleep here. And he would put his own children to sleep there in a home that he knows it might be attacked. A home that he, he knows it might be assassinated. Is this someone who does not believe in the Prophet? Someone would do that who would not believe? Obviously not. Abu Talib was a firm believer and he defended and he helped and he supported the Prophet until the seventh year after the Ba'tha, the seventh year into the prophethood of Rasulullah, the pagans in Mecca, they decided to sanction the Muslims and place the Muslims in a siege. No one is allowed to buy, no one is allowed to trade, no one is allowed to marry with them, no one is allowed to do anything with them. They come and they tell them, they, write, they take a piece of paper and they write on the paper, no one, this is a law that all the heads of Mecca have signed, no one is allowed to deal or talk or do anything with any of the Muslims. They go and they take that paper and they place it inside the Kaaba, inside the sacred house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sacred, the cube, the Kaaba. He goes, they put it there, and the Muslims, at that time they were a handful, they are just a few. They go and they enter into Sha'b Abu Talib, the farm of Abu Talib. And there 
were the most difficult days in the life of Rasulullah and in the life of the Muslims. They had no food to eat. They were suffering. They were sanctioned. They couldn't buy. They couldn't trade. They couldn't do anything. And many men of God have gone through this type of difficulties. Many men of God have been sanctioned and persecuted just because of their faith. This is not the first time and it's not the last time. But this also happened with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Of course, some of the idol worshippers, they were related to some of the Muslims. So sometimes they would sneak in some food here and there to help them because some of them were related to them. But this siege went on for three years until one day, and Abu Talib, he's also suffering in that siege. He's also going, becoming weak. He doesn't have food. He doesn't have anything. One day, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi comes to his uncle Abu Talib while they were in Sha'b Abu Talib. He tells him, oh my dear uncle, that paper, that document that they wrote and they hung it in the Kaaba has been eaten by a termite. It's, it's in the middle of the Kaaba. The Prophet has no access to it. No one has gone in there. He tells them it's been eaten by a termite. The only thing that the termite did not eat was the name of God. Bismikallahum. They put the name of God and the name of God and then they put the treaty. Because the idol worshippers did believe in God too, but they believed in other gods as well. And the message of Rasulullah was La ilaha illallah. There's no God other than the one and only Allah. So they wrote, in the name of God, Rasulullah tells his uncle, everything has been eaten. That whole document has been eaten except the name of Allah. Abu Talib, he tells Rasulullah, is this what Jibra'il told you? Is this what the arch archangel Gabriel told you? He tells him, yes, this is what he tells me. So Abu Talib, he comes out to the mushrikeen and he tells them, I'm willing to make a deal with you. I'm willing to talk to you. They say, yes, see, Abu Talib, now he's willing to give up. Now the siege is going to break and he's going to give up. He's going to hand over Muhammad to us because they wanted him to hand over Rasulullah to them. He tells them, my nephew Muhammad, he tells me that a termite ate the document inside the Kaaba. If he is right, then he is the, if, if it turns out to be true, then that means he's right and you have to break the siege. And your plot is going to be foiled. And if he is not right, I will hand him over to you. Because that would prove that he's not a prophet. That would prove that he's not a messenger. So the pagans, they became very happy. They said, yes, finally, Abu Talib, now you're talking straight. Now you're willing to make a deal with us. They go and they see that the document has been eaten. Except the name of Allah. Except Bismik Allahum, everything the termite it has eaten it. And the siege was broken. And Rasulullah, he walked out of Sha'b Abu Talib. And everyone, many people, they saw this miracle and they joined the religion of Islam. So now they cannot carry on the siege. So this is something that happened with Abu Talib. Now if Abu Talib was not a believer, if he did not believe in the Prophet, would he come and hand over his son like that? Because some people, his nephew like that, some people they say Abu Talib's love towards Rasulullah, towards Muhammad, it was because he was his uncle, not because he was a believer. But he proved by telling them, I'm willing to hand, over, hand him over to you. If he, if he is not true, through that he proved that he actually believed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he actually had faith in Rasulullah because if it turned out that the termite had not been eaten, they would have came and they would have taken his nephew, the one who he loved, the one who he honored so much. So at the end of those three years, the siege was the 10th year after the Ba'tha and that was the year Abu Talib passed away as a result of the pain, as a result of the suffering that the Muslims went through and Abu Talib was an older man. He passed away as a result of that. Now, one thing Abu Talib he did or he did not do was that he did not publicize his faith. He did not come out in public and publicize his faith. But his actions and his words proved that he was a believer. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us stories of sometimes certain individuals that do not publicize their faith. That's not always what is what needs to take place because God knows what's in the heart.
God knows what's in their hearts. You don't need to always come out and say something. Allah gives us an example of a believer in the court of Pharaoh who protected the life of Moses, who protected the life of Musa. Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مُؤْمِنٌ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ يَكْتُمُ إِيمَانَهُ There's a believer from Al Fir'aun, from the people of Pharaoh, but he is concealing his faith. Why? To preserve the life of Moses, to preserve the life of Musa. Similarly, Abu Talib, he saw himself in a position that he has to preserve the life of his nephew. He can't go and announce that he is at war with them, the mushrikeen, and that is going to jeopardize the life of the Prophet and is going to more importantly jeopardize the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So this is why Jibra'il comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he tells him that he tells him يُقْرُؤُكَ السَّلَامُ وَيَقُولُ لَكَ إِنَّ أَصْحَابَ الْكَهْفْ أَسَرُّ الْإِيمَانَ وَظَهَرُ الشِّرْكِ فَأَتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ أَجْرَهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ the people of the cave, Allah gives us a story of the people who slept in the cave. They concealed their faith to preserve their life and Allah rewarded them double. Because it's more difficult to conceal something that you actually believe in. And then Jibra'il tells him that, Jibra'il, that Abu Talib did the same thing. وَإِنَّ أَبَا طَالِبْ أَسَرَّ الْإِيمَانِ وَأَظْهَرَ الشِّرْكِ فَأَتَاهُ اللَّهُ أَجْرَهُ مَرَّتَيْنِ Abu Talib, he concealed his faith and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards him twice for his actions. In another hadith, one of the companions of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he comes to the Imam and he tells him, إِنَّ النَّاسَ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّ أَبَا طَالِبْ فِي ضَحْضَاحٍ مِّن نَّارِ يَغْلِي فِيهِ دِمَاؤُهُ They come and they tell him, they, he tells the Imam, he says, these people the people who do not follow the Ahl Bayt, they say that Abu Talib is in the hellfire and he's being tortured in the hellfire. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, كَذَبُوا وَاللَّهِ إِنَّ إِيمَانْ أَبِي طَالِبْ لَوْ وُضِعَ فِي كَفَّةِ فِي كَفَّةِ مِيزَانِ وَإِيمَانْ هَذَا الْخَلْقِ فِي كَفَّةِ مِيزَانِ لَرُجِّحَ إِيمَانْ أَبِي طَالِبْ عَلَى إِيمَانِهِمْ He says they lied. Abu, the Iman, the faith of Abu Talib, if it was placed on a scale, and the faith of everyone else was placed on a scale, the faith of Abu Talib would have been heavier, would be heavier. This is the faith of this great man, Abu Talib salam. He died in the 10th year after the ba'tha of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and after he died, Rasulullah became very sad. That year was referred to as Amil Huzn, the year of sorrow for Rasulullah. And that was the year that Rasulullah realized that he has no future in Mecca. He has to leave. As soon as he saw that his supporter and the one who helped him has died, and in that same year Khadija also passed away, the wife of the Prophet. That was the year Rasulullah realized that he cannot live in Mecca anymore. And that was when he planned and he began planning on migrating to Medina. However, when Rasulullah was walking in the funeral procession of Abu Talib, he tells him, Ya Am, Juzita Khaira. Oh Am, he begins to speak to his uncle Abu Talib. Of course, the body, the casket of Abu Talib. He says, Oh my dear uncle, may Allah bless you and give you for what you have sacrificed for my sake. Juzita Khaira, Falakad Rabbayta, Wa Kafalta Sagheera. Because you raised me and you helped me when I was young and you supported me and you were there for me when I was older. You were there for me at all times. And then he says, أَمَا وَاللَّهِ لَأَسْتَغْفِرَنَّ لَكَ وَلَا أَشْفَعَنَّ لَكَ لَأَشْفَعَنَّ فِيكَ شَفَاعَةً يُعْجَبْ لَهَا الثَّقَلَانِ By Allah, I'm going to ask Allah to forgive you and I'm going to intercede for you in a way where all of the humans and the jinn are going to be surprised with that intercession. They're all going to be astonished with that type of, that type of, that type of shafa'ah that I will intercede for you. Of course, after that, Jibra'il comes to Rasulullah 
and he tells him, Ya Muhammad, ukhruj min Mecca, falaysa laka fiha nasir. Oh Muhammad, now it's the time to leave Mecca because you don't have a supporter anymore. My dear brothers and sisters, this is Abu Talib, the father of Imam Ali, the man who supported the Prophet, the man who defended through his action, through his words. But today you see how some people are willing to manipulate the truth because of their bias, because of their agenda, because of their hatred for Imam Ali salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyarah and the shafa'ah of this great man Abu Talib alayhi salam and the imams from the, from the progeny of this great man Abu Talib. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tahireen.